Hi, folks. Uh, thank you for spending a little under an hour with us today talking about one of the most exciting areas in um, in Gen AI applications uh, that's really started to come to fruition in the last, I would say, six months or so, uh, which is uh, multimodality. And we'll describe what that means in the coming slides. Um, and we're lucky to be joined here with our friends at, um, at Nomic. Um, and um, we'll just spend a little bit of time talking about what multimodal embeddings are how to visualize them. And then once you're using these in production, we'll give you a couple of applications that you can use these for. Uh, and I'd love to hear in, in the Q&A as well, applications you might be using these for internally. We'll talk about ways to monitor them in production to ensure that your applications using multimodal embeddings or multimodal uh, foundation models writ large uh, are performing uh, sort of up to snuff. And so um, before kicking it over to my co-presenter, Zach, uh, I'd love to mention that uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We'll see those in a little text box on our screens. Uh, it's likely we won't see them immediately because we'll be presenting. Um, and uh, we'll either respond live or at the end of the session. So please do make this a chatty uh, discussion. We'd love to learn from you in the same way that we hope you'll learn from us. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to uh, Zach, my co-presenter. Thanks so much, John. Really excited to be here. Um, and th thanks for inviting us. Um, for those of you do that don't know me, I'm Zach. I'm a machine learning engineer at Nomic. Uh, Nomic builds explainable and accessible uh, AI tooling. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is how we trained our embedding models, Nomic Embed Text, and our sub subsequent uh, aligned vision model, uh, Nomic Embed Vision, um, which powers our uh, data visualization tool called Atlas. Um, yeah, so here's a little bit of a background on what we're gonna be talking about today. We'll give a little intro on multimodal embedding models, give a little demo of, uh, no, uh, of Nomic Atlas, and then John's gonna talk about monitoring capabilities. Um, and then we'll also close out with some recent research about multimodal embeddings and then some QA. Um, so, what are embeddings? So right now, I'm sure many of you have heard of you know large language models, either through ChatGPT or Llama. Um, you know, it seems like there's a uh, language model released every day. Um, and, you know, uh, latest and greatest. Um, but a lot of the times, these models are are used with uh, retrieval augmented generation. Um, and right now, many of these language models are very expensive to train um, and their knowledge, you know, the facts that they see over time during training are frozen due to the way, uh, you know, they are trained. Um, so using uh, RAG, which is an acronym for retrieval augmented generation, people tend to use these language models as a reasoning engine alongside an embedding model. So uh, this this allows people to uh, use a language model without having to fine tune, which can be uh, ex uh, extremely expensive. And um, instead, using RAG is, is fairly cheap. Um, and as well, another added bonus is the embedding models are historically a lot smaller and more uh, and cheaper to run. Um, so you add a small overhead for a large performance improvement. Um, so what what really happens during RAG is um, a user has a question, um, whether it's a question about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you'll say you have a bunch of Wikipedia articles and you're asking questions about, you know, say Albert Einstein or something like that. Uh, the question gets embedded. Um, you find the uh, most similar documents in your uh, corpus, which would, you know, in this case, be Wikipedia. You find the most, uh, you know, the top similar documents, and then you pass those to uh, your language model alongside, you know, your question. And you say, hey, uh, you know, ChatGPT, uh, Lama, like, can you answer this question given this evidence uh, and based on my question? Um, so the, the language model will then go ahead and, you know, given given the uh, information that you provided it through the embedding model, um, try to answer the question. Um, so at a high level, this is uh, one of the, the big advantages of using embedding models. Um, uh, one big difference that uh, may not be obvious is the embeddings, uh, the, the outputs of the embedding models encode information into vectors, whereas generative models such as Llama 3 and ChatGPT generate output given an input. Um, and embedding models have uh, a lot of uses outside of just RAG. Um, so one of them might be semantic search. Um, so this is kind of like a fuzzy search. And instead of doing like an exact match over your corpus, you can search for things that are similar. Um, clustering, 
um, which is what powers um, Atlas. Um, so whenever users upload uh, text to Atlas, we convert those to embeddings. The embeddings get uh, reduced down from their uh, uh, dimension down into 2D into, into like an X, Y coordinates. Um, so two points that are similar together end up near each other in our 2D visualization, um, which I will, I'll show some uh, demos later on as well. Um, and then another big use case is semantic deduplication. Instead of looking for exact matches, um, if you wanted to clean a data set, you could use embeddings to find very similar uh, uh, pieces of text and remove, you know, close duplicates. So this could be things like misspellings, uh, rephrasals um, that might have very similar embeddings, but like may, may fall through exact um, uh, deduplication. Um, yeah. So uh, what are embeddings? Um, one way that I like to think about it is that they are machine understandable semantics. Yeah, you know, another way to put it is numbers representing the meaning of your input. So in this case, you know, it's uh, text. Um, and then in, its, in this example, you have, you know, uh, three, three sentences. One is Goldilocks travel through the woods, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, and then uh, the Chicago Bears, uh, a sentence about the Chicago Bears. Um, so you would pass this through the embedding model, which is the uh, green triangle, and out comes a big list of numbers. Um, in, in the gnomic embed text case, this is 768 uh, numbers. Um, some models have larger number of, of uh, numbers in, in, you know, representing the embedding. Um, some have smaller. Um, it's just a matter of like the model architecture. Um, but the thing that the embedding models are trained to do is to uh, map sentences that are similar in you know, text space um, to the same, you know, region in uh, embedding space. So what this means in, you know, a very simple example in this, you know, three sentence example, you would want these two texts about fairy tales to be mapped closer together in embedding space than uh, this sentence about the Chicago Bears. You know, even though that like the sentence about Goldilocks and the, the sentence about the Chicago Bears both have the word bears, it doesn't mean they necessarily mean the same thing just because there's a word overlap. So really the goal is to encode the, sem the semantic meaning of the sentence rather than just like uh, something simple like does how many words overlap, which is a lot of, you know, what the research um, has been based on, but, uh, but yeah. Um, so moving on to gnomic embed text. Um, at the time, there was no good performing long context text embedder that was open source. Um, at the you know, then it was OpenAI's Ada and OpenAI text embedding three. Um, Gina released a little bit before us, but uh, they, they released a comparable model that still uh, underperformed OpenAI's uh, Ada. Um, and a lot, a lot of the higher performing embedding models um, had shorter context lengths at, uh, at the time. Um, so one question that comes up a lot is like, okay, why does long context matter? Like how much meaning can you really pack into um, a fixed dimensional vector um, with, with large amount of text? Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting use cases that I that we're exploring now and excited about exploring uh, in the future as well. Um, one of them is being like being able to encode the meaning of long documents such as um, uh, you know articles or papers, like especially scientific papers um, that you know would get truncated or you would have to find interesting ways to. Uh, chunk it up to encode, you know, different sections correctly. So with Novik Embed, you can um, uh, encode a larger portion of a, of a paper or, or an article um, than, than you would with a, a shorter, you know, quote unquote, higher performing model. Um, and then another thing, you know, as we are very uh, open source forward, um, a lot of the things that we uh, found when we were going about this was that there were a lot of details that were hidden, specifically around data, like the data around um, what the models were, the, the embedding models were trained on wasn't clear, um, how the, how long, you know, how the, the models were trained uh, was, you know, opaque at best. Um, and the papers really didn't, um, you know, describe in detail what they did. Um, so there was a lot, there was a motivation on that side as well of like, we wanted to spell out a recipe that anybody could go through um, and train their own high quality uh, state of the art uh, embedding model. And, you know, with our recipe, you, you know, we found that you could train your own embedding model from scratch for, you know, less than $10,000. Um, 
And yeah, and then as far as like product side of things, Atlas only supported short documents, uh, short documents for embedding. So this this was a big improvement for the Atlas side of things that we can know we can now uh, embed long documents um, accurately. Um, and yeah, we were the best performing uh, less than three hundred million parameter uh, long context embedding model. Um, and then recently, uh, it's been one of the top sentence embedding models on Huggy Face. Over, I think it has around ten million uh, embedding. Uh, sorry, ten million downloads uh, and counting. Uh, it's used daily in production with Atlas. Um, and like I said, we released the recipe to rep reproduce everything. We have our paper, we have the code, and we've also released the data. Um, this, the, the, the model is also uh, Apache 2, so anybody can go and run it, use it in production uh, and whatnot. Uh, and then uh, another neat thing has been uh, seeing the adoption of Gnomic Embed. We've seen it uh, used in other benchmarks, whether it's long context RAG uh, benchmarks or even as the backbone of uh, other models that people are printing, such as Snowflake. So Snowflake used uh, Gnomic Embed uh, as a uh, initialization for their Arctic Embed uh, M-Long, which is really cool to see. Um, yeah, so um, how do you go about training a text embedding, embedding model? So like I said before, the goal of the embedding model is for the embeddings of similar text, you know, in text space are represented similarly in embedding space. Um, so how do you do this? Um, so you learn this by forcing uh, the embeddings of similar text to be closer together while also pushing uh, embeddings of text that are dissimilar farther away. Um, so you uh, gather a large uh, group, a uh, large data set um, in the Gnomic embed uh, uh, case, we gathered, I think, around 240 or so million pairs of text, um, which included, you know, questions and answers from uh, search queries, um, titles and abstracts from papers, um, rephrasals, uh, things of that sort um, that represented, uh, you know, a broad uh, breadth of, of, of you know, different use cases that people might use embeddings for. Um, collected them, curated and cleaned them, um, and, and trained with a, a very large batch size. Um, so in this example, um, you know, the simple example, imagine that you have a bunch of questions and answers. The first case is, what's the capital of France? You pass it through your embedding model, uh, you get an embedding for that, um, you get a grouping of documents, you know, pairs of the capital of France, the Chicago Cubs won the World Series in 2016, and then uh, he orders uh, a Vesper Martini. You get the embeddings for those three documents, um, and you compare the uh, question with all the documents. Um, so in this case, the positive answer would be Paris is the capital of France, um, and the other two would be like considered negatives. Um, so when you're training these models, what would happen is you would force the, uh, you would try to match basically the representation and force the embeddings of the uh, question and answer about pair of, uh, France together while pushing the, uh, represent the embeddings of the other two sentences away. Um, yeah, and then you, uh, so you do this uh, using a loss function called info NCE. So if you, uh, you know, a fancy way to, to describe this, uh, this process. Um, so uh, the questions can be thought of as like, sorry, the, the positive example in this uh, example is the purple. Um, so you get the positive pair, you get the similarity. Um, and then you compare it across all other um, positive negative pairs. Um, and then you you construct this with a bunch of other um, uh, you know examples and in your data set and you do this with a large batch size um, and you train this for you know a, a long long time. Um, it's a few things that I uh, glossed over very quickly that we train these models in three stages. Um, first is like the uh, original BERT uh, mass language modeling uh, training phase where you um, Take a sentence, corrupt some of it, and try to predict the corruption. Then you take BERT and you do um, this contrastive pre-training, this weekly supervised uh, contrastive pre-training, which I just described. And then you do this contrastive uh, fine-tuning, um, which is 
very slim, similar in to what I just, just described as contrast pre-training. But uh, in, in addition to having just random negatives in your batch, you also mine for hard negatives. So an example of this may be uh, you fetch sentences about other uh, teams that won the World Series, whether it's, you know, the 2015 World Series or, you know, maybe something about the Red Sox and the Yankees. Um, so the so the model learns to distinguish between uh, very similar, semantically similar, but not uh, correct examples. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned before, uh, you're able to train uh, a high quality model using a recipe for under $10,000, which I thought was uh, really neat that you can, uh, you know, have a, a great performing model for, you know, less, for, for really, you know, maybe not as a fraction of what many of the uh, large companies are training their language models uh, for. Um, yeah, so the next step is, okay, now we have text. Uh, we want to expand this to uh, other modalities. Um, how do you do that? And first, even before we get there, what is what is multimodality? What does that mean? Um, so what I described is, you know, training a, an embedding model for text. Um, but this, it doesn't just apply for text. You can train an embedding model for any sort of input data, whether it's image, video, audio. Really, what we're doing here is you're encoding the meaning of the data. Um, you know, for example, for text, this is, you know, what the text is talking about. Um, for images, this might be like the main subject in the image, you know, maybe some, something in the background that, that stands out. Um, uh, and similarly for, for video, um, uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, the, the main goal is, is to capture the meaning of, of the content in the embedding. Um, so why are embedded multimodal embeddings useful? Um, it allows, you know, uh, if, if the text, you know, for in this example, the text and image embeddings are aligned, it allows users and, and humans to use natural language to search across non-text data sets, which, you know, is a tough thing to do uh, without these without these embedding models. So if you have a large image data set, you know, previously, if I had this and I was trying to train a model and I, you know, didn't know whether my data set was clean or not, a lot of the times I would just, you know, cycle through each example or cycle through a, a small handful of it. Whereas now with, uh, you know, uh, multimodal embeddings, I can now do like a semantic search across uh, using text across all the images to find things that I might not have previously seen, you know, just doing a random sample. Um, so for example, in uh, this, you know, small image, this is a, uh, map of 8,000 images of dogs and cats. Um, so the blue dots are, are uh, dogs uh, and the uh, orange dots are images of cats. Um, and these are just the image embedding. So imagine that you uh, wanted to find all the images near, you know, say uh, the word bark, then, you know, as you, as you can see, you know, most of the dog uh, images get highlighted, and you know this is using the multimodal embedding search. Um, and then, contrary, you know, using uh, meow, you get uh, uh, images that are you know mostly cats. Um, yeah, so you can easily more easily find structured information across unstructured data, uh, like images with embeddings and semantic search. Um, and that leads us to gnomic embed vision. So uh, at the time, uh, there was no high performing multimodal encoder uh, uh, for image and text. Um, so, you know, a few years ago, uh, OpenAI released uh, Clip, um, which performed really well on these multimodal tasks, such as ImageNet uh, and DataComp, which is uh, DataComp is a collection of uh, 30 or so um, retrieval uh, zero shot classification tasks. Um, but it performed really poorly on text only um, uh, performance. So this is like, you know, similar to like the gnomic embed uh, text uh, benchmark that we ran before. Um, so if you were only embedding things with the, the clip text encoder, you were sacrificing a lot of performance. And we felt that like, if we would really want to, uh, you know, improve Atlas, we would have to uh, have a encoder that performs well across modalities as well as, uh, uh, unimodality, so meaning it has to perform well uh, text on text uh, benchmarks as well as text to image and image to text. Um, 
So we released Nomic Invision, uh, Nomic Invent Vision, uh, which outperforms existing multimodal encoders across text and uh, uh, multimodal benchmarks, as you can see here. Um, and yeah, so how did we uh, train a Nomic Embed Vision? So it's very similar to how we trained um, uh, Nomic Embed Text. Um, so instead of it being, uh, you get the embeddings of two, uh, two groupings of text, you get embeddings of uh, images and texts. Um, so this is the uh, normal clip training. Uh, so you get a large corpus of uh, images and text scraped from the web. What you really do is you crawl the web, you know, such as common crawl. You look for like the image tags uh, and their uh, associated alt tags, and you pair those as uh, you know your your positive image and text pairs. Um, this is you know can be incredibly noisy, but uh, there have been some interesting efforts. Um, in the mo and in the last year or so, exploring like better ways to curate uh, more data sets. But, um, but yeah, like roughly speaking, you just get a large data set of around you know a billion or four hundred million pairs uh, and train with a large batch size. Um, so uh, for in Clip's sake, they trained um, with over four hundred million pairs for around thirteen. Uh, uh, so they have a data set of 400 million image text pairs, and they train for uh, 13 billion pairs total. Um, there's some, you know, recent re work from Apple that released better uh, clip encoders uh, using some really nice and interesting um, uh, filtering techniques, like learning a model to filter uh, the data, uh, which I thought was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, so but but what we found when you train a text or a, a multimodal encoders like this is your text performance really degrades. We've tried lots of different uh, approaches, uh, but the one we settled on was you just freeze the text encoders. So you just take your trained nomic embed text model um, and then you align uh, nomic embed vision uh, to the text. So what that really means is that you only make updates to the weights of the uh, nomic embed vision model. Um, and you know you keep the nomic embed text uh, frozen. So there are some nice properties that emerge from that. A, we get good uh, text performance as well as multimodal performance. It means that every single embedding that would that uh, any user had uh, generated with nomic embed text now is multimodal for free. So you don't have to re-embed everything. Um, uh, and, and yeah, the other things that we did try were, you know, maybe uh, updating the, the text encoder, you know, with both text and text, uh, text to text pair, similar to how we uh, first trained the text model, as well as, you know, trying some fancy things, but ultimately this was the easiest and, um, simplest way that we could work in, you know, sometimes the, the easiest thing works, um, yeah, it, it works the best, um. Yeah, so um, I'm going to show three quick demos. Um, what, uh, but yeah, can you guys see the screen of Atlas? I think we can. Right, awesome. So this is uh, Atlas. Uh, it's uh, Nomex core product. Uh, what this is is a map. So we we call this an Atlas dataset, and this map represents. Um, uh, six million entries of Wikipedia. Each point on this map is a Wikipedia article. Um, and the way to think about this is that two points that are semantically similar, um, if, you know, if they're talking about the same thing, that, you know, they're talking about related things, will be closer together on the map. So for example, if you go on here, you'll see, you know, there's this cluster of fish and crustaceans and coral reef. Um, and reptiles nearby, you know, talking about similar things. And similarly, if you go over here, you'll see stuff about, you know, baseball and sports um, uh, and things like that. So there are some really neat uh, things about Atlas that I want to demo. So one of them being is um, the ability to filter on arbitrary metadata. So if, you know, with uh, uploading the embeddings alone, you get these nice clusters, but you can also add uh, metadata. So for example, you can add, you know, the ID, the URL, uh, the title, um, and then we also have these uh, auto-generated uh, topics. So if you wanted to filter on, you know, things about fish, um, you could go in and see like, oh, here are all of the articles about fish, and then potentially like um, search for thing, do it an exact search for um, uh, clown fish and see if something comes up. Um, 
So I guess not, that didn't show up, but, um, but yeah, so like the, I think that one of the, the powerful things about Atlas is um, being able to interact with large data sets at scale. Um, another interesting thing is say I wanted to do some, you know, digging into uh, this baseball cluster. Um, I can uh, lasso this region, um, select all the points in there and then do a semantic search. So uh, for, uh, Bay Ruth. Um, so hopefully this will highlight articles talking about baseball specifically, maybe um, uh, Babe Ruth, um, you know, Babe Ruth Award, um, you know, other baseball players, uh, you know, his home run record. Um, so I think that, you know, alongside uh, the, you know, uh, attribute filters and the metadata filters, uh, as, well as, as well as the exact search, uh, semantic search really uh, empowers, um, uh, you know, this fuzzy search across, um, uh, you know, this unstructured data, which is really, really powerful. Um, another demo I wanted to show was um, the semantic search for multimodality. Um, so, believe, you know, this is a similar dogs and cats map. Um, uh, you can go in and search for, you know, bark. Then we see, you know, here are the embeddings that are closest to, you know, your text search of bark is the, sorry, the closest images to bark. Um, and then similarly to um, meow. Um, and, you know, this is like a, quite a simple demo, but you can imagine that if you have a data set of web scraped images and you wanted to uh, find all the examples where someone's running or you're, you know, someone's um, uh, playing an instrument, finding that by hand can be really, really tough and time consuming. So using something like the magic search in Atlas can, can save you a lot of time. Um, and similarly here, here's a, like a, a web scraped data set um, where I can showcase one of the cool things. So you can also add, uh, you know, now that you have semantic search um, enable, you can search for things, you know, such as like a happy dog. And you'll see that there's a cluster of, you know, dogs that are, that look happy or memes about like happy dogs. Um, here's a dog around Christmas. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's that's really all I had. Wanted to show some cap cool capabilities of Atlas, especially the multimodality, which I'm really excited about. Um, and yeah, I will hand it off to John. Yeah, thanks so much, Zach. Um, I actually have a question that I'll hold to the end about the Atlas demo that you just gave, but I do want to bring up one question in chat that I think you can answer really quickly. It's about the multilingual not multimodal, multilingual capabilities of, I think it's just gnomic text embedding. So is this just English or languages beyond English? Yeah, so right now it's just English, but one of the big efforts that I'm focused on, focusing on in the next you know six months or so is uh, expanding this to too many languages. Um, I think uh, th that's one of the, the big initiatives that I have. Awesome, um, cool. And uh, can you see my screen now, Zach? Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, amazing. So like I mentioned, um, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A box uh, in your Zoom chat, and we'll do our best to answer those either live or hopefully at the very end of our discussion. Um, I'm just going to talk for about 15 minutes now about, you know, once you have these embeddings or once you have multimodal models as well, uh, you know, Zach mentioned um, uh, uh, multimodal, you know, foundation models as well, um, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that these are these are being deployed in a responsible way, and how do you ensure that you're getting you know net positive ROI on what is being deployed? And so, um, thirty second overview of Arthur. Um, so Arthur is um, uh, 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 sort of the 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 one stop shop for deployment and um, monitoring of uh, of AI, and so this can include traditional machine learning uh, as well as uh, generative AI applications and um, the products that I'll talk about most today uh, are uh, Arthur Shield and Arthur Scope. So one of these is a firewall product for generative AI applications. You know, tracking things like hallucination rates. Uh, either in uh, you know most of our customers are still just doing text to text style models, but you know increasingly text to image and others that I'll cover in the coming fifteen minutes or so. As well as Arthur Scope, which is a monitoring product, and I'll discuss one of the uh, sort of novel pieces of IP we put together there for tracking uh, distribution drift. Uh, in embeddings, and I'll have some nice visualizations for that. And so if you're interested, uh, obviously, uh, we're happy to chat more. 
Yes. Cool. So, um, you know, I'm, I speak for myself here, but these are these are roughly what what are we seeing out there uh, with regard to multimodality writ large? So, this could be multimodal embeddings, or these could be things like uh, GPT four, which uh, in I think mid twenty twenty three or so uh, embedded. Uh, GPT four V, which is a vision model uh, into into their systems, and they've obviously uh, developed a lot more since then with GPT four uh, O and other launches that you may have seen that include uh, things like speech uh, and other modalities. Um, uh, competitors like Google's product Gemini and Anthropic's product Claude three at the time three point five more recently uh, quickly followed suit to include other other modalities beyond text in their uh, very easy to use UIs as well as with API calls and so on. Um, and uh, both Zach and I are huge proponents for open source models and open sourcing uh, code for training, training data, model weights, and so on. Uh, there have been quite a few open weight models, not necessarily open source entirely models, and shout out to Nomic for doing a lot of work in true open sourcing of these models, uh, such as Moondream, uh, variants of uh, what's called Lava, uh, non-transformer style models, so variants of, if you've heard of Mamba, for example, uh, variants of that uh, that include other modalities beyond text, such as Meteor, uh, and, you know, I'm sure some of them have been released today, you know, after we made these slides and so on. It's a very active space, and, um, uh, you know, it's an exciting time to be in, in this space as well. I do want to shout out, though, that it's really early days for a lot of these multimodal models, right? So for those of us who are using, you know, November 30th, 2022 or whatever, we, we hop onto ChatGPT uh, and it's very, very trivial to get uh, text hallucinations to pop out of the system. You know, fast forward a couple of years into the future and uh, text hallucinations have, you know, it's still obviously a huge issue. But uh, to their credit, these, these large foundation model companies have done a very good job at uh, starting to tamp down on some of the, the, the text-based hallucinations. But when, you, when you're using these multimodal models, it's, it's trivial to break them. Uh, and you don't even have to try to break them. You're going to naturally use these, use these models and, and, and you'll break them in a variety of ways. And so when it comes to monitoring these sorts of models in production, um, even defining what, say, for example, toxicity means in a world where you have text and image and audio and video and maybe other modalities uh, is very difficult. I would say more difficult than defining what tox toxicity means in terms of pure text. Or hallucinations are, um, you know, we can argue about whether or not that should be the word that we use, but basically incorrect things popping out of your system, uh, uh, they're almost trivial to do, uh, even in these like GPT-4.0, for example, and I'll give you an example of this right now. So here, if you hop on to ChatGPT-4, you know, this is a paid account. Uh, this is something that I did maybe about a month ago, uh, and I just asked a very, very simple question. So here's text as input. Please draw 13 red circles, and we have multimodal output here. So here's an image along with text that GPT-4 uh, spit it out to me, confidently telling me that there are 13 red circles arranged as I requested. And um, I am not very good at mathematics, but if you were to count these circles, you would see it's clearly not 13. And so this is a very, very simple example. Um, and actually, it's, the, it's literally the first example I tried and got an hallucination off the bat. So tracking this kind of stuff is, um, it's very early days, it's important to do, and it's actually often very hard to define even what you should be tracking. And, um, you know, this is something that Arthur's been focusing on for quite a long time. I um, would love to chat more and, and, you know, hear about how you're defining that in your own applications as well. Um, I will say the most common type of multimodality that we're seeing right now, and, you know, you saw this with Zach's uh, no make embedding vision uh, discussion that he just had as well uh, is just a combination of image uh, and text. And uh, as Zach mentioned, you know these these are possible. These models are possible to be trained because we have these enormous data sets online where you have these pairings of images and, for example, alt text or captions where you can train train these models. And this covers a ton of natural useful tasks. And we are starting to see these getting deployed both as hobbyist sort of science projects within the enterprise and also uh, moving toward production on the enterprise side as well. And so obviously things like generating captions for images, uh, doing image retrieval, you know, um, uh, Zach was just showing this uh, with the, the Finding Nemo example and the Babe Ruth example and the Happy Dogs example, uh, basically saying, hey, find me all pictures of cats with six toes, um, hate speech detection and social media and so on. And then obviously the biggest one is visual question answering. Uh, I have an image here of Clip, uh, which was mentioned earlier, uh, saying, hey, in a particular image, uh, you know, how many people are looking outside of a window or in this image, uh, how many how many pens are there? Or on this this picture of a manufacturing line, uh, how many widgets are on the conveyor belt? Uh, or how many strawberries are on a conveyor belt in a farming example? Or you know, there are tons and tons of examples here where where question answering becomes very very important, and we're seeing that across across different verticals on the enterprise side as well. So an up and coming example, and there are lots of these out there, but here's one that we've seen both with that GPT four O demo that occurred, and also with uh, uh, some examples of different enterprises playing around with, uh, with, with these technologies are 
some inclusion of text, maybe with images or video, along with uh, speech. And so, um, for example, Wendy's uh, was uh, was playing around for a while with um, uh, speech to text ordering and then text back to speech uh, 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 for basically a, a spoken chat bot for ordering uh, in drive throughs And, you know, that I think we're going to see more and more of this technology be deployed. Um, this is pretty cool. It's a good example of not being limited to only two modalities, right? There's no reason to just limit yourself to two modalities, although, uh, as, as Zach will tell you, it becomes very hard to train once you start moving beyond about two modalities. Um, but, you know, an example here is the GPT-40 or Omni launch, where you had audio, you had images, you had text. Um, this will allow us to capture all those same applications as before, uh, but now we have speech input and output, right? And so as a human, you know, I'm speaking to you right now, and hopefully you'll speak back to us with Q&A toward the end of this discussion. This is a very natural way to interact with various systems. Um, and these are cool. So th these, are, these, are, these are models that are trained end to end instead of piecing them together. And so, uh, you know, there are reasons to freeze various forms of embeddings where you're doing multimodal training. Uh, and there are uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages to not freezing and doing the entire training pipeline all at once. And um, so this is a really, really early days sort of discussion of, uh, of how one might train these, these, these models going forward. And it's pretty cool. So this, this works very well. Uh, latency is very, very low on this. So this is one of the cool um, uh, things that popped out to me when seeing that GPT-40 demo was just how natural and low latency uh, speech responses were uh, when humans were interacting with the system. And, you know, we're only going to see this getting better over time. Um, there are uh, some open models in this space. There are startup competitors in this space. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, um, when it comes to like more than two modalities, I haven't seen any true open source launches here. Uh, there are some open weight models out there. Um, but, you know, I'm sure um, our friends at Nomic are thinking about this as well. So I, I will, you know, this is um, my own sort of uh, view here, but I, I do think open source lags a bit when it comes to moving beyond two modalities, when it comes to open, even open weight models in this space. Um, and one last thing is we haven't seen much in uh, actual deployment on the enterprise side of moving beyond uh, just text and image, or even just text and text, but text and image as well. So I haven't seen much in terms of enterprise deployments when it comes to, for example, text and image plus speech or uh, text and video, things like that. So let's keep expanding the number of modalities, right? So here's a shout out to our friends at Meta, uh, who really went uh, above and beyond and included six modalities uh, in something called ImageBind. And this is an open weights model that has some code involved as well, but I don't believe uh, you know, uh, Zach, uh, keep me keep me honest here, but I don't believe they released the actual training data for this, for example. So I don't think you can actually replicate the creation of ImageBind uh, if you had Zuckerberg levels of money. Even. So uh, this has six modalities, pretty cool, right? So images, video, and text, these are all very natural things to think about, but also depth maps, right? Think uh, think about being an autonomous vehicle or, or, or being, um, you know, some sort of, uh, 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 you know, LiDAR enabled sensor on a manufacturing line where you can get uh, and uh, a pretty accurate estimate of how far away a particular, for example, pixel is, or how far away a particular object is. Uh, they include temperature and thermal maps, as well as something called an inertial measurement unit. And you can think of this as like, if you shake your phone or turn your phone or whatever, it's it's some signaling to, to, to the operating system that what you're doing. And so they jam all of these modalities together uh, into something called ImageBind, which is really, really cool. And so that's uh, hopefully going to enable uh, applications that, you know, like I mentioned, you, we have autonomous driving, obviously, but um, uh, very sort of in-depth applications on manufacturing and supply chain sort of lines as well. And um, this is really cool. It's open weights, which is to say I can download the model, I can play around with it. It's not fully open source, which is to say, for example, I don't have the training data that went into it. Um, and they have some really cool results that popped out of this. Uh, for example, they have uh, really, really strong results for zero shot recognition tasks, uh, where one can ask some questions about things that weren't paired up in the training data uh, and get pretty reasonable responses out of that. And so I encourage you to play around with that. And really, really exciting to see all these modalities being jammed into, uh, into models. So when it comes to monitoring, popping back to embedding specifically, so these vectors of numbers that Zach was talking about, when it comes to monitoring these multimodal embeddings, um, there's a lot of this that remains sort of the same as traditional, quote unquote, traditional ML monitoring. And so what I mean by traditional is, you know, this could be tabular features that I can explain that I'm passing through some system, or it could be, um, you know, traditional sort of computer vision or natural language processing style uh, approaches to, um, uh, to solving tasks. So these are, at the end of the day, just sort of vectors, and they're vectors with semantic meaning. They're vectors that are attached to images, for example, or text, but they are just vectors of numbers, and they're the same vectors that we've been monitoring for many, 
many years. So we're going to care about things like, for example, data drift, right? So it could be the case that I train my model on a distribution of data on the internet, and then uh, I don't know, new 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 image pairings come along, right? Uh, Zach was mentioning Babe Ruth. It could be the case that some uh, you know down the line, some new baseball player comes in. Uh, who's really, really strong, and uh, and and uh, he or she is not part of my training data set, and so like, what do I do with that, right? Um, or it could be the case that I expect user behavior to be uh, uh, in a particular pattern, and uh, over time that that user behavior drifts, and I want to be alerted to that, right? And so um, this could be something like uh, in the semantic search applications that we talked about earlier. You know, are, are my users searching for dramatically different topics than I expected? And you know, I trained my model to be good at a particular type of search, and now they're searching for some other thing that wasn't represented well in my training data, and, uh, you know, I'm getting worse performance overall than I expected. And how will this impact my bottom line? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is what all of us care about when it comes to deploying traditional and Gen AI applications is, uh, is measuring ROI, and right? So things like data drift will impact downstream business KPIs, they'll impact downstream revenue, they'll impact downstream uh, user, uh, you know, satisfaction with the product, uh, and being able to be alerted to a degradation in that is very, very important. So again, I want to say these models are new. They're generally not reliable. In general, you know, uh, 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 machine learning is is uh, it's very stochastic as opposed to sort of more traditional decisioning, which was deterministic. So it's very important to keep an eye on everything that is uh, going on. Um, you should track your metrics. And you should define these metrics. Uh, and uh, you know, don't don't trust a priori and don't trust sort of set it and forget it style machine learning that's put into production. You should you should keep an eye on it. Um, Final thing is, you know, these, these are early days. There's some really exciting research going on in this space. I just grabbed uh, a recent paper that was announced, I think yesterday actually, which was talking about uh, hallucination rates uh, in multimodal models, specifically vision and language models uh, that are looking at multiple object detection tasks. So sort of like that, uh, that circle image that I showed you earlier with 13 red circles. This would be something like I have, you know, a bunch of different objects put on a table and I ask you how many cups there are and how many pens there are and so on. Um, uh, this is a really interesting discussion of, um, uh, how bad hallucination rates get when it comes to these um, uh, uh, multi-object detection tasks. And I'm highlighting this for one, because literally this is like a day old, this research. Uh, and two is uh, that multi-object detection is a very, very common use case when it comes to like vision tasks on uh, manufacturing floors and so on. And so um, we, we, we do need to solve some of these problems and get a handle on them before, be, before um, uh, uh, some of these models can really be trusted in, 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 um, in high impact situations. So, I want to just spend a couple of minutes diving into some novel IP that we had um, come out in a short white paper at NeurIPS, which is looking at, uh, hey, you have drift in, for example, embeddings, uh, and you want to be able to look at or uh, understand sort of lockstep drift behavior uh, across time. So this could be a bunch of users see some meme on the internet, and now they're searching for whatever, skibbity toilet or whatever in your, in your text. That wasn't part of your training data, and you want to be able to see this emergent cluster of behavior pop out and maybe visualize it in a tool such as uh, such a Nomic Atlas. Um, and there are a bunch of different ways to do drift detection, highlighting uh, a very sort of common one that we've seen in the tabular space here, which is something called an isolation forest. The idea here being that um, uh, sort of anomalous points or sets of points are, are going to be, um, well, separated in space from, uh, from non-anomalous points. And it's a very sort of simple algorithm for trying to identify these points. Uh, it uh, doesn't scale very well with dimensionality. Uh, and when it comes to things like embeddings, um, I actually don't remember offhand what the gnomic embedding dimension size is. It's like 1300, is that uh, 13, 1300, right, Zach? 768. 768, okay, cool. Yeah, so that's a big number uh, and it's gonna be hard to, um, uh, uh, to scale that up when it comes to a technique like isolation forests. Um, a more common uh, sort of form here is to look at things like statistical divergence measures. Um, this has some issues when it comes to explainability and scalability, but this is something where we'll lean on this a bit more um, in uh, the coming slide. And so I just want to give a really, really basic example of what I mean by drift or lockstep drift behavior. So here we have three clusters of, um, let's say that these are user searches, for example. So uh, one of these is, is baseball related, one of these is basketball related, and one of these is clownfish related, something like that. And I've uh, looked at uh, various metrics before deploying some sort of system that uses these embeddings into production, um, I'm showing these points in blue. And then I put this into production and maybe users start searching for slightly different things. So this is an orange. This is kind of production time um, uh, uh, searching. And so for whatever reason, let's say that, that 
at bottom left corner cluster is for, for baseball, they've started searching for uh, baseball in a slightly different region of the US or something along those lines. And I wanna be able to identify that sort of lockstep shift in that cluster's uh, uh, behavior uh, automatically. Okay, so blue here is what I expected. Orange here is let's say a month down the line after putting something into production. This is how the users are actually searching for things. And I wanna be able to identify that. So uh, how do I do this? Well, very, very sort of simple simple approach here. So here I have in the top left, let's move from top left down to bottom right. I have that same uh, blue cluster of uh, today and then that orange cluster of a month from now's behavior. I can train some sort of classifier that's going to attempt to differentiate between today's data and uh, and a month from now's data. Okay? And I have those labels because I know what today's data is and I, you know, a month down the line, I know what the month from now's data is. And so I can train this classifier. It's going to give me a score for every point that says, I think, with say 0.98, uh, this is a, 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 a anomalous behavior, and this is this is not anomalous behavior with 0.028 or something like that for every single point. Okay, and so now with this classifier for every one of those points, I can run, for example, a feature importance method such as SHAP, which is at a very high level going to for every one of these numbers in my vector could be features that I uh, uh, have semantic meaning for from a tabular model. It could be uh, uh, dimensions in my my 768 dimension. A nomic embedding model, I'm going to get a score for how much that particular dimension contributed to uh, my classifier thinking that this point is or isn't uh, anomalous. And then if I then sit in that explanation space, as opposed to the raw input space, I can look for lockstep clusters of different points that have similar looking explanation vectors stating that we think that you know dimension two and four and 12 together are combining into this being anomalous point. I have like five or six of these, I cluster them together and then I can ascribe semantic meaning to that cluster and say, hey, it looks like this is a new cluster, a new emergent behavior that's popping out of my system. So just to walk through that uh, in a little bit more depth, we have this classifier. It's gonna tell us for every input, we have a sort of an anomaly score. And then that anomaly score, that 0.92, I'm going to ask a, uh, an explanation system such as SHAP uh, to uh, ascribe uh, positive or negative values to every one of those dimensions to add up to that score. And then I'm going to cluster in that SHAP space to understand where those clusters are. So we're really excited about this approach for a couple of reasons. One is it works for traditional ML and it works for embeddings uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, you know it's agnostic uh, to sort of the the source of that vector of numbers that 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 it's going into. Um, two is it actually runs very very quickly, so it scales very nicely, um, and um, uh, uh, um, yeah. So uh, we we find this nice. And three is uh, it actually has some nice explanation properties as well. So I can apply some very very traditional sort of data analytic techniques such as scope rules to sit on top of uh, these clusters that are popping out that are emergent, and I can get actual English descriptions of, hey, cluster baseball drifted because uh, of high dimension, let's say two and four, uh, and then, you know, a, a data analyst or an MLE can dive deeper into that data and sort of understand what those dimensions might look like. So this can be helpful for debugging, this can be helpful for um, uh, understanding sort of uh, production time uh, impacts on, uh, on, on various drift metrics, accuracy metrics, and so on uh, for downstream tasks that you might be using these embeddings for. Um, and so if you're interested in this particular work, we have we have this paper linked to from uh, from Arthur's website, and I'm happy to chat more. Um, and so I'd like to just sort of end on this particular slide, which is just going to uh, sort of uh, uh, trigger some Q&A. And so uh, there's a lot to look out for when, when, when deploying multimodal uh, embedding-based applications or multimodal foundation model-based applications. Um, and, uh, you know, Zach can, can talk very deeply about the train time difficulties that come into um, trying to train multimodal uh, embeddings. Data imbalance is a big one of these. Uh, mode collapse or mode separation is a big one of these. Uh, trying to understand the dimensionality of your embedding vector uh, is one of these as well, in the sense that, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, bigger embedding vectors uh, take a lot of space, right? Uh, the, just to be blunt. Uh, and so you might want to, you know, look into things like Matryoshka embeddings and so on when, when doing train time um, uh, uh, multimodal um, uh, model training. Um, production time, you know, I, I talked a bit about drift. So drift impacts uh, every downstream metric you might think of, and drift is going to happen in almost every production system because the world is changing. Um, various accuracy and efficacy metrics for uh, for rag steps. Zach touched on this a little bit, um, but you know, understanding uh, uh, drift in user behavior might also uh, impact uh, the retrieval steps that you have in applications, or it might also impact 
uh, downstream metrics like accuracy or classification rates, whatever. So um, there's a lot to keep an eye on when looking at these multimodal embeddings. Uh, the systems themselves are getting better very, very quickly, both on the open source side as well as the closed source side. Uh, they're not perfect yet by any means. And so when you move further away from text embeddings or text and vision embeddings, which are becoming a little bit more mature to like text and vision and speech and so on. Uh, it's really the wild west out there right now. And so, you know, keep an eye on the space for the next six months, 12 months and so on. And um, I'll leave it at that. So I'd, I'd love to take some Q&A. There's a lot of Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, John. That was great. Uh, yeah, start going down the list. So I think this first one is for you, Zach. Could you please elaborate on resizable and binary embeddings in knowing? Yeah, so um, something that you actually just mentioned, um, storing these embeddings can be very expensive, um, especially if they're you're, you're storing Wikipedia or something on the orders of you know, tens or hundreds of millions of documents. Um, so one way to reduce your storage costs is uh, using resizable or Matryoshka embeddings, um, which basically you train the model to pack the information towards the front of the embedding. Um, so you uh, so you can then truncate, you know, either your embedding in half or in quarter or so on and so forth. Um, you can also try and use uh, binary embeddings, which uh, are cheaper to store, I believe, uh, if I remember off the top of my head, but also are faster. Um, to retrieve. So you can uh, retrieve, you know, say five to 10 more, five to 10 more times uh, examples using binary embeddings, which are just like ones and zeros instead of the float representations. Um, and then use the, use the full precision query embedding to re-rank everything and then get the top, uh, you know, the correct embedding. Um, and a lot of times that your precision or your, your performance is similar, maybe maybe slightly degraded, but not as much as you would expect. Um, so you can both improve on uh, storage costs as well as uh, inference costs. Cool. Um, I guess we're just going through the, the backlog here. So are there specialized multimodal embedding models for flow charts or block diagram figures containing different blocks and complex information flow? Um, I can give a, a quick response to this. So structured... <laughs> Generation and understanding of structured data is um, it's a super hot area, and I, I'll say you know um, like vanilla foundation models actually do a pretty poor job of uh, working very well in that space. Um, I'm guessing folks are looking at that. I don't know exactly. Does anything come to mind like startups that are looking at like flowchart generation? Um, not that I know of off the top of my head. There was a paper I saw recently recently that's like slightly related of basically doing a uh, visual retrieval across like documents, whether it's like financial documents or, or papers with charts and stuff. Um, I don't know if that's along the lines of what the, the person was asking. Um, but yeah, like, like, you know, being able to retrieve across like the actual images versus having to do like OCR to get the data out and convert it to text and use embeddings. Um, the, the, the former approach seems to be working a lot better. Yeah, yeah, it's an it's interesting discussion, right? And so um, when it comes to things like structured generation, you're going to see a lot of folks uh, using tooling and agents to call out to actual sort of code to create um, to create those 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 artifacts as well. And so um, almost certainly there are, there are some startups thinking about that. Um, can you comment on the cost of training multimodal embedding models? Ten thousand dollars. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I. I, I don't know if I have the exact number off the top of my head. I remember, I think it took around four days on two H100 nodes. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, I don't re exactly remember the cost, but I think that one of the bigger costs, honestly, was just getting the data. I think we scraped around 12 billion pairs and then filtered it down um, using... Um, yeah, some of the things that Apple open source, which is really nice, um, but like actually getting the data costs a lot because it was it was you know I think around at least twenty terabytes, if not more. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of <laughs> also egress costs were were a little bit more than expected. That is a lot, and actually I'm gonna hop a little bit further in the list because of this uh, dovetails with that question. So how much does it cost to fine tune an embedding model? Yeah, great question. Um, for when we fine tune gnomic embedded text, it took like about an hour, and we fine tune on about a million examples, so less than a hundred dollars, yeah, depending on how many experiments you run. Perfect. That's cool. 
Um, okay, so Robert asks, what new developments are you seeing in terms of AI explainability? Yeah, ex AI explainability is a very interesting space, right? And um, uh, people have very strong opinions about whether or not uh, uh, its uh, various techniques are useful or not uh, for debugging tasks or downstream tasks as well. Uh, this could be its own one hour conversation. But, you know, one of the cool areas in AI explainability that's happening right now is, um, you know, spearheaded by a lot of folks at Anthropic, this mechanistic interpretability approach, which if you have white box access to, uh, for example, a transformer model, um, you can uh, search over, well, the hypothesis for the kind of mechanistic interpretability pitch is that um, subsets of nodes, if you take like affine transformations over uh, their, their, their activation values are going to align with particular well, alignment concerns you might have like terrorism or anti-terrorism, racism or anti-racism, things like that. And so if you can find these combinations of subsets of nodes, this transformation over those, you can clamp down on those activations and in some sense uh, understand uh, or even control the alignment of a particular model. And again, I'm not making uh, sweeping statements about whether or not this is good or bad or is working or is not working, but I think it's an exciting development where there's a lot of work being put into sort of understanding what's going on in these specifically these transformer models and being able to clamp down on those um, in, in sort of a human understandable way. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any enterprise level sort of like production level uh, uses use cases for mechanistic interpretability yet, but I, I know that there are some startups working on this as well uh, alongside obviously Anthropic. Um, do you have a recommended list of metrics to monitor from a production perspective? Uh, yeah, so yeah, if you look at the, the Arthur AI docs, for example, you know, this is the our bread and butter for five plus years of existence has been in the monitoring space, and there are oh so many metrics. So it's going to be a combination of traditional metrics you might think about, uh, uh, such as, you know, accuracy and F1 score and so on. If you have a classification test, if you have something that can be, uh, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, or if you have uh, gold, started, gold standard data, uh, you might have some similarity metrics that you might think about. So think about just text, right? So uh, is, is a result that pops out of a text-to-text -text model uh, uh, correct? I might have gold standard data saying, you know, Babe Ruth is the best baseball player. If I then ask uh, an LLM, for example, who is the best baseball player? And it says that baseball player is Babe Ruth. That's a different answer than my gold standard answer, but it's still correct in some sense. And so I'm going to have various metrics. You know, you can think about similarity scores. Um, I think Zach actually mentioned like cosine similarity for doing like embedded similarity. You can track those as well. And then uh, you might have sort of human sort of human centered metrics that you want to track. And these could be either uh, generative models doing evaluations for you, or these could be actually calling out to different humans as well. And so I know that's a little bit of a, 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 a nebulous answer, but like there are so many metrics that you might want to care about that it's going to be looking at a giant list and then understanding what matters to your, your end use case. That's one response. The second response is also uh, benchmarks. Uh, so benchmarking for Gen AI applications, a uh, very, very uh, hot area right now, and that uh, um, uh, a lot of people don't really trust the benchmarks that are coming out for a variety of reasons. But you can look at task-specific benchmarks, for example, coding benchmarks, or translation benchmarks, or mathematics and reasoning benchmarks, and so on. Um, keeping an eye on those, I think, is really, really uh, important as well. It can help inform you about what specific metrics you're going to care about for your task. Um, and I'd like to just do a quick shout out to our uh, machine learning fellow. Uh, we have an, an intern program basically over the summer here at Arthur, uh, who uh, is one of the authors on one of the coolest benchmarking projects that's come out recently, something called livebench.ai. So I'd encourage you to check that out as well. So it's, it's a pretty nice approach to benchmarking. It can be very informative. Um, okay, so we have time maybe for like one, one more question. Uh, Zach, any of these resonate with you? We have quite a few questions. I'm, I'm I'd obviously love to follow up with, with other folks. We're just at the hour. Yeah, um, I can answer. I can type in some of the, the quick questions. Um, if, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess the one about uh, multimodal search for model debugging, I think, is an, an interesting question. Um, but the question is, what are your thoughts on using multimodal search for model debugging? Is it a reliable way to identify biases, blind spots? If so, is there a way to automate the evaluate, evaluation versus hu having humans annotate the results? Um, I think one part, which I think John will speak to, is you know being able to monitor it. Um, on like the Atlas side of things, um, you can imagine, say you have like a content uh, moderation model that you've trained and you want to double check it against live data. You can upload uh, your, you know, basically your model's predictions alongside uh, live data and see like where your model fails. And you can use that kind of to iteratively um, update your model and, and 
you know, improve your models. And we see that a lot of people are using Atlas as a way to um, spot check either the outputs of their model or the, the inputs of their data. Um, so in, in their machine learning uh, systems. Cool. We are being told to leave the stage. So I'd like to say, if you have other questions, please reach out to, I'm just John at arthur.ai and Zach is just Zach at nomic.ai, is that right? Yep. Um, so hit us up with questions. Uh, we, we'd love to chat. And again, thank you so much for, for spending an hour with us.